All right. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the Civic Center Next 100 uh, uh, public meeting. We're so glad to have all of you here uh, tonight. My name is Happy Haynes, and I'm proud to be the executive director of Denver Parks and Recreation. Um, and uh, it is uh, it is my pleasure to start with a very important uh, and traditional acknowledgement. Denver Parks and Recreation honors and acknowledges that the land on which we reside is the traditional territory of the Ute, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples. We also recognize the 48 contemporary tribal nations that are historically tied to the lands that make up the state of Colorado. We honor elders past and present and the future and those who have stewarded this land throughout generations. We also recognize that government, academic and cultural institutions were founded upon and continue to enact exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. May this acknowledgement demonstrate a commitment to working to dismantle ongoing legacies of oppression and inequities and recognize the current and future contributions of indigenous communities to Denver. With the kickoff of the Civic Center Next 100 project, we continue to honor the responsibility to be good stewards of this open space. And I want to thank specifically Denver City Council and the Denver Indian Commission for creating this important land acknowledgement and allowing us to use it. And so we'll begin with uh, Gordon Robertson. I'll turn it over to him to help uh, frame the rest of the evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Happy, for that very important acknowledgement. I wanna welcome everyone here today at this, to the Civic Center Next 100 Public Workshop number one. My name is Gordon Robertson, and I am also very proud to be the director of the Park Planning, Design and Construction Group at Denver Parks and Recreation. Today, we are excited to kick off with you the public engagement effort for the Civic Center Next 100 project. As we embark upon the public process over the next eight months, we wanna hear from you about the future of improvements in Denver Civic Center. This effort will result in a holistic concept design for four key areas within Denver Civic Center, including the Greek Theater, the Central Promenade, the Central Gathering Feature, and Bannock Street. The 2005 Civic Center Park Master Plan has set a vision for these spaces, and this project will further develop design ideas for these four key areas, with input and design direction from the public that will be implemented in Civic Center. The four project areas include the Greek Theater, funded by Elevate Denver Bond, which is intended to enliven the theater to become a premier outdoor performance venue for the city of Denver, the central gathering feature, which will include a new three-dimensional element aligned along the central promenade and becoming a new space in the heart of the park. The central promenade, which links the Greek theater and Voorhees Memorial, will continue to be a unified space that is a critical link within the park and will better accommodate both events and daily use. And lastly, Bannock Street, the recently closed area between Colfax and 14th Avenue, will be reimagined as a permanent public gathering space in front of the city and county building. These four projects will be the most significant public improvements to the heart of the city in over a hundred years. We have an opportunity through a single comprehensive public engagement effort, that's what we're doing today, to re-energize these four areas within Civic Center Park. We'd also like to take a moment to thank our partners. We wanna thank Councilman Hines for participating in this process. Civic Center Park is in his district, Council District 10. We also wanna thank our project partners. We wouldn't be here today without them. They include the Civic Center Conservancy and Elevate Denver Bond Program. And lastly, and most importantly, we, we also wanna thank and recognize the voters who approved the Elevate Denver Bond in 2017, 2017, which has made the funding for the Greek Theater Project possible. So next, I wanna introduce the team that's working on this. Uh, of course, our uh, excellent executive director, Happy Haynes, leads our team. Uh, Jenna Harris is our project manager at Denver Parks and Recreation. 
Laura Morales with Denver Parks and Recreation is uh, we're in our communications team. Kelly Turner is our project manager with transportation and infrastructure, formerly known as Public Works. Eric Lazar Lazari is our executive director of the Civic Center Conservancy. And then our consultant team, Nicole Horst and Megan Chiatani with Wankin Associates and Meredith Winskoski with Liv Livable City Studio. Two excellent design firms we're excited to have on board. So with that, let me turn it back over to Happy Haynes. Thank you, Gordon. For over 100 years, Civic Center has been the heart and the civic pride of our city, centered around government and culture. As Denver's historic and cultural hub, Civic Center has been the stage for the Rocky Mountain region's largest cultural gatherings, demonstrations, and celebrations for decades. We just recently celebrated the Greek theater's 100th anniversary. And this year we look to celebrate the 100th anniversary milestone of the Voorhees Memorial at the north end of the park. This rich history and Mayor Spears' City Beautiful movement will always be honored by being Denver's first national historic landmark. As the stewards, it is our calling to remember our past as, as we did in our opening acknowledgement and continue throughout this planning effort for planning for our future. The outdoor downtown plan gave us a great start, establishing a vision and a roadmap for the future of our downtown parks and public spaces. Investments in our public realm is vital to sustaining a healthy, inclusive, and livable downtown, not only for ourselves, but for future generations. And for all who want to, to be a part of this beautiful public space, Civic Center is no exception to that. With the momentum of the Bannock Street uh, closure just a few months ago, as part of the phase one transformation, we are redefining our public realm and rights of way as places for people, interwoven into the people places of Civic Center. So we have a unique opportunity with this project to reimagine not only the key uh, spaces that you will see in Civic Center, the Greek theater, the central promenade, the central gathering feature and Bannock Street, but to look at the entire Civic Center area um, from a from a you know from a higher view, and and think about how people come into this space, how they move through the spaces, and how all of these magnificent civic um, uh, institutions and structures and the park all uh, work and interact together. So we have a very exciting once in a lifetime opportunity for our generation to set the table for the next 100 years and to bring new energy to a culturally and historically significant public space uh, in our city. So in, in, in embarking on this uh, historic uh, opportunity for us to reimagine the next 100 uh, years in the Civic Center space, we are so fortunate uh, to have fantastic partnership with the Civic Center Conservancy, with the support of Denver voters and Elevate Denver Bond that begin this process to rehabilitate the Greek theater into a premier performance venue as it was Im imagined in the Civic Center 2005 master plan. And of course, we can't do this alone and are leaning on partners at not only at the Civic Center Conservancy, uh, who will be um, uh, aside, uh, alongside us throughout the process, helping to guide this process and beginning to write the next chapter of Civic Center and implementing the vision, not only of uh, out, the outdoor downtown plan, but also the, mass, the Civic Center master plan. Uh, and we're excited to have you as partners and, and so many organizations and individuals and stakeholders who care so deeply about our city, about the downtown core of our city 
and what this tremendous civic space means to all of us. We're excited to collaborate with all of you on what is, uh, what I view for me personally, and I hope you do too, as a legacy project. For our city and for Mayor Hancock's administration, um, this is a truly a, a generational uh, opportunity, a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so it's my pleasure uh, to hand it over to our key partner in this endeavor, uh, Eric Lazari, who is the executive director of the Civic Center Conservancy. Eric. Thank you so much, Happy. We at the Civic Center Conservancy are thrilled to be kicking off this process with our partners and friends of the city. Our partnership exists because Civic Center is a special, unique asset to our community and deserves both public and private attention. This is truly a monumental moment in the storied history of Civic Center as we build on the foundation set forth by the community supported master plan and bring those visions to life. We sit here today at the start of a process where over the next several years in phases of work, will collectively evolve Civic Center and shape it for generations to come. For over 100 years, Civic Center has been the heart of our community. It is a place to create memories, a place to preserve history, a place of respite, a place to gather. This is a place where community celebrates a Super Bowl victory, where it sees fireworks to kick off the Independence Day celebrations. Last summer, we saw Civic Center come alive with the Black Lives Matter demonstrations and protests. It's the home of dozens of First Amendment activities every single year. These large scale celebrations and protests are what Civic Center is most known for in the current era. But Civic Center is also a neighborhood park to the Golden Triangle, to Cap Hill, to downtown Denver. It welcomes thousands of school children each year from all over the state who are on field trips to the state capitol, Denver Public Library and Denver Art Museum. It is where our unhoused neighbors feel safe and can receive a lunch and connect to services. It's a place where city workers gather for a Friday lunchtime soccer match, a place where food entrepreneurs start their empire with a food truck, a place to experience public art, some nearly a century old and others that pop up like the Black Love Mural Festival last summer. It's a place that despite all of this still needs work if it is truly to be a place for everyone every day. As we kick off the Civic Center Next 100, we are asking you to share your thoughts, ideas and passions about this place that is special not only to Denverites, but people across Colorado, as well as visitors from across the globe. You will help shape Civic Center for the next 100 years. What a legacy you can leave for people today and generations to come. It is critical to this process that you help shape the conversation. We will have some questions that we will ask you throughout this presentation. We'll have significant time at the end to address any questions you may have. Please use both the Q&A and the chat to help drive this conversation. I will now hand it over to Jenna to walk us through tonight's agenda. Great, thank you so much, Eric. We are absolutely thrilled to be here with you all this evening and to hear from you about the future of improvements to Civic Center. For today's agenda, we will first walk you through how this Zoom webinar works and the opportunities to provide feedback as Eric mentioned. Next, we will have you participate in a series of live polling questions so we can learn a bit more about who is here with us this evening and how often you visit Civic Center and what brings you to the park. We will then walk you through the vision and principles for the Civic Center Next 100 project. At the end of the presentation, there will be plenty of time for questions that will be answered live by the panelists. This is truly the most important part of the webinar and we are looking forward to hearing from you. We are really excited to hear from you about what questions you have for the team and this project. Questions that we can't get to this evening will be recorded and answered in a frequently asked questions document following this workshop. Lastly, we'll walk you through the public engagement schedule and next steps for staying engaged in the Civic Center Next 100 project. I will now hand it over to Meredith. Thanks, Jenna. So we just want to start with a few kind of housekeeping things and how you guys can share your feedback uh, throughout this webinar. So I think as, as it was said at the beginning, this webinar is being recorded and then it'll be on, um, it'll be made available after the presentation. During the presentation, the way you can interact with us um, is using the chat interface to answer open-ended questions. So we're gonna ask you questions throughout the presentation and please use the chat feature um, to, to answer some of those. The panelists will be able to see those chat answers 
and we will be reading some of the responses back to you throughout the presentation so you get an understanding of what other people are, uh, the feedback they're providing as well. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the question and answer interface. Um, everyone is able to see those questions. So if you have a question that other people, you want other people to see, definitely use that. Um, we are gonna do our best at the end to get through and answer as many of those questions as we can. If we do not get to yours, um, we will be uh, putting out a, uh, an FAQ at the end or after this meeting that really digs in and answers all those questions. Um, one other thing to note related to Q&A is if somebody asks a question and you also have the same question, you can use the upvote feature, which I believe is that thumbs up feature under their question so that we know a, a lot of people or how many people have that same question and we'll make sure we try to get to those. We'll be doing some live polling throughout the presentation, so that should automatically pop up on your screen. Um, and hopefully everyone will participate in those. We'll also share the responses as we go. So we're gonna dive right in and show you how that works and uh, get an understanding of who is here joining us tonight. So the first question we have for you guys is how often do you go to Civic Center? So thinking about kind of pre-COVID time, um, did you go, did you visit Civic Center multiple times per week? once a week, maybe a couple times a year, only a few times a year, or um, do you rarely go to Civic Center? We'll just wait a few seconds here and give everybody a chance to, to share um, how often they go. All right, it looks like it's slowing down a little. If you wanted to get your vote in there really quick, I'm gonna hit end in a few seconds. Okay. Great, thanks, Laura. So you guys should be able to see, see the results on this now. So 32% of you said a few times a year. Um, and then we had a couple times a month, multiple, multiple, multiple times per week and once per week. So actually a pretty even spread throughout all that. And then 6% of you guys said you rarely go to Civic Center. So um, we'll share a lot of ideas tonight about hopefully getting people there more often. Okay. So the next question we have for you guys is what typically brings you to Civic Center? Do you live near Civic Center? Do you work near Civic Center? Um, do you visit when you're enjoying nearby cultural destinations or uh, visit for special events? Um, or have you never been there to Civic Center? Or if you have any thoughts um, that aren't on here, um, feel free to add them to the chat so we can see them. It'd be great to know what typically draws you here. All right, it's starting to slow down, so get in your last votes. Okay. So probably pretty consistent with um, the, the question or the answers we saw before that most people, 59% uh, visit for special events or festivals. Um, and, and that is kind of closely aligned with the visiting, um, you know, several times per year. So, but again, kind of a pretty good spread. We have 40% saying they work near Civic Center, 21% saying they live near Civic Center, 42 visit when you're enjoying nearby destinations. So those the 9% of you that said other, um, it'd be again, great to hear your uh, feedback and chat. Nicole? Thanks, Meredith. Um, it's exciting to hear that you guys love Civic Center as much as we do and go there. And I think as we have 
put this vision together for the next 100, what has really driven a lot of the work that we've done to date is this idea of everyone every day. And how do we really make this a place that um, people go to more often? Um, our vision that we've put together is improvements to Civic Center will catalyze new activity and animate the heart of Denver. The transformation of four key areas will fulfill past planning visions and elevate Denver's first national historic landmark for the next 100 years with new daily energy, world-class performances, and events. We are, as Gordon talked about at the beginning and happy, we are focused on four integrated projects that are part of the partnership between the city of Denver and city in the Civic Center Conservancy. And each one of the, these is an outdoor room unto itself, but it's also really important as we're thinking through this project of how we can link these together to really um, create a strong um, vibrancy within the park. So Bannock Street is the first one, which um, is between um, 13th and, and or 14th and Colfax. <laughs> so, thanks, Meredith. The central promenade, the central gathering feature, and the Greek theater. And because most of you have been here, I'm pretty sure you know where all of these sites are, but we'll, we'll walk through them here in a little bit more detail. So Bannock Street, on the next slide today, it in the past, it was the street in front of the city and county building, and it was closed as part of the phase one improvements to traffic. Um, the mural was put down, um, temporary furnishings and trees, movable planters were put in that space. And what is happening with phase two is the final design for the improvements for um, this civic plaza and how we reimagine that space. The central promenade, I think, is a space we all know well. It's where Civic Center Eats happens. It's the, um, the really strong pedestrian connection through the park that connects the Greek theater and the Voorhees Memorial. Uh, it hosts events today, and it will continue to do that into the future. The central gathering feature um, is, is right off of that, that cultural axis that, that the, um, the promenade is on, that is the, the north-south connection in the park. This is where the flower gardens are. You see the image on the right of the pride celebration gardens, um, the seasonal gardens that change and really draw people into the park. The vision for this space is really, it's at the heart of Civic Center and to really draw people in um, and to think about this in a new way to really um, form this, this uh, heart to the space. And we'll talk, about, we'll talk about the future here in a little bit more once we get into the presentation. And then the Greek theater is, um, as Happy said, the Elevate Denver Bond is really to make this a premier outdoor performance venue. Um, this is a, in the past, it has held performances for up to 1,200 people that you see there on the left. It had square dancing events. It was the epicenter of the Black Lives Matter um, movement this summer, where you can see all the people that came to this space. It's where civic pride happens. It, it really shows a lot of our civic and cultural diversity. And as we start thinking about these four spaces, um, we're gonna walk through what makes a great public space. And we wanna keep these ideas in mind as we ask you some questions about the experience in each of these spaces. So we have five key things that we think about when we think of those five, the great public space. Activation 18 hours a day and four seasons, that it has to have playful elements, both in the summertime and in the wintertime. Food and beverage is important, that you can go into the park and get a coffee and a snack and have a place to sit down and observe what's happening and really just be in the outdoors to see the daily events that are happening the yoga classes, whether you're a participant or an observer, it just starts to, to give life to the space. 
events of all sizes throughout the year. And Civic Center is amazing at this. It is, it hosts great festivals, demonstrations, protests, civic rallies. Um, but it, we think of this as in terms of small scale events and large scale events that the space needs to be flexible enough to host both and, you know, have the boot camp classes as well as those bigger festivals all throughout the year and all seasons. It needs to be inclusive of everyone it, it, um, and accessible to everyone. So all ages, all cultures, all ethnicities, all abilities. Um, it provides space for both visible and um, invisible disabilities so that everyone is truly welcome here. And it's a, it's a place in the city where it belongs to all. I think, um, Economic diversity is something that's really important too, and Civic Center serves a, a great need and services for the homeless community and how we can all coexist in these spaces is something that's really important and successful urban, urban design. Comfort and beauty, and I think as we've all been through COVID this last year, the, the, the creature comforts of being outside and being in the outdoors are more important than ever, that there's opportunities for shade, trees and plants and seasonal color that, um, that we can enjoy, welcoming lighting that makes you feel comfortable, flexible seating that is movable, that um, it's inviting, and that we're using timeless materials really as we, we think into the next 100 years. The game plan talks about uniquely Denver, and I think this is this is something that really does make a space that um, Denver, as Happy said at the beginning, this is the homeland of the Arapahoe, Ute, and Cheyenne. Civic pride happens here. Civic Center is so different than any other place in Denver because of these cultural and civic institutions that surround the space and how we really um, can bring that into the park and celebrate it. Civic Center has elevate has, has historically um, been a place for marginalized voices, the Black Lives Matter movement. It has a legacy of disability rights with the Gang of 19, um, local businesses and, and really our Western frontier culture and our outdoor culture as Coloradans. How do we really make this space um, unique to Denver and to, to who we are as a community? So we've developed um, a number of principles that really further reinforce the vision that Nicole just went over um, and really will help guide uh, the, the designs that we're doing. Um, so I'm gonna give you an overview of the five principles and then we're gonna go through each one in a lot more detail and ask you guys some questions about them. So the first one is to really focus on making Civic Center a place for people making it welcoming and engaging for everyone. This is about being inclusive of everyone, all, uh, all people, all abilities, um, the economic diversity that Nicole mentioned, children, residents, visitors, um, and, and really focusing on the experience for everybody. The second one is elevating Civic Center um, as a destination centered around cultural and community anchors um, and activities. The last three of, of our principles have more physical design implications that will help guide us moving forward. So celebrating the historic significance, um, incorporating real resilient design, um, and reinforcing those phys physical and visual connections. So our first principle to enliven Civic Center as a place for people create a place that is active, engaging, welcoming, and comfortable to everyone every day. We have looked at some of the data from 2019 that really digs into the events um, at Civic Center and McNichols, um, just to understand, it's kind of one data point where we, to understand kind of how many people are coming into and out of Civic Center, um, and how can we kind of build upon that. Um, so as you can see from these charts here, there, there's a lot of events that happen um, within the park and at McNichols and a lot of people that are coming to the, the event. So 
some questions we have and we'll explore through this process are how can we get these people to stay longer and how do we get people outside of these times to really activate the space um, 365 days a year. So we've been exploring ideas around that and, and how do we activate that? What, what could be um, incorporated into Civic Center to, to keep, get people here all the time or make sure they're st staying around all the time? So things like summer uh, interactive water features that could potentially transition to holiday displays um, or, or ice rinks over the winter, table games and rentals, um, making sure that we have spaces and seating that's inclusive of everybody that wants to visit and stay and spend time at Civic Center. Um, food and beverage ideas, because we know that if you're able to get some food or have a drink, you'll likely stay in a space a lot longer. Um, and places really to play. Um, you know, there, there's something to say about having kind of joy and delight in our outdoor spaces. So um, ideas around incorporating that is something we'll explore. Um, and of course, more seating. You really can't have enough seating in great public spaces. Principle two is to elevate Civic Center to form a prominent destination centered around distinct cultural and community anchors. So there's a lot happening today in the park, a lot of really wonderful things from um, exhibits like the Jano Eckelman exhibit to the Tree of Transformation, but also the murals, the Black Gloves murals that were, were done recently, the Ai Weiwei um, exhibit, and also Cinco de Mayo. They, these are cultural events and destinations and activities that happen at the park today um, that we can really uh, build upon through this. Some other ideas we've started to explore are things like uh, sculpture, really I iconic pieces um, of art in the park. Could be water, it could be art, or it could be a destination, a food and beverage destination um, that is more iconic. Um, the uh, premier outdoor performance venue, really thinking about how we elevate the Greek theater, theater to that, um, or having a really destination water feature that um, is desirable and, and draws many people into the space but they can also be temporary experiences, whether they're temporary play elements, rotating art exhibits or installations um, that, that honor people or communities. Um, these are all ideas that we will explore through our process. So what we're gonna do is dig into each of these spaces, um, each of the kind of four spaces uh, a little bit more um, and share a little bit more detail with you guys and ask you some questions about them. So as we think about Bannock Street, um, the vision here is to, to turn it into a great civic plaza. And the outdoor downtown provided some great guidance around this, um, that of the desire to uh, create a large civic event space um, for festival programming. And so while Bannock serves much this way, much of this way today, um, this further reinforces um, the need and desire for it to function that way in the future as well. The recently completed Denver Moves Downtown Plan um, reinforces that Bannock needs to re remain a key bikeway because it really serves a lot of cyclists into and out of downtown on a daily basis. Um, so this is another kind of key design parameter we'll be working within as we move forward. Um, and also thinking through the public safety and the limited vehicular access. So as Nicole mentioned earlier, um, you know, the, the phase one improvements are in place. Um, and so these design parameters really guide the final design as we move forward. So a question we have for you all um, is what would you most like to experience in Bannock Street Plaza? So we're going to launch a live polling here that I think just popped up on your screen. Um, and some options that you'll see are uh, temporary movable recreation. So these ideas of pickleball or a, a half sports court, um, unique winter holiday displays or more cultural performances, fitness classes, large scale art installations, um, I shared some interactive water feature ideas, 
um, or simple things like grabbing a bite to eat or meeting with um, others, whether it's friends or family or coworkers um, in the outdoor space um, or shady areas. And last but certainly not least, areas for um, kind of playful, fun, and joy or whimsical elements. So I believe we're asking you to select your top three here, you know, and if you have any other ideas that are not listed here, please share them in chat. It looks like they're still coming in. We're about 70% voted. Okay, they're slowing down a little bit. So if you're still picking your top three, go ahead and hit enter. I'm gonna end it in just a few moments. All right. So we've got about 100 people that have voted. So I'm gonna go ahead and end voting. Great, thanks, Laura. So um, you guys can see the results now. So it looks like the top two were cultural performances and grabbing a bite to eat. So what's interesting about this is that it really kind of balances this idea of um, you know, destination or kind of events and performances, although they could happen every day as well, I guess. And this idea of kind of eating and the food and beverage, which is more of an everyday activity. So, um, but, but there were, met, and, a number of other ones that came in kind of close after that. So thank you for your feedback. The next one we're gonna talk about is the central promenade. Um, so this is the, the, connect, the pedestrian connection between the Voorhees and the Greek theater. It's where Civic Center Eats happens. And the 2005 and 2009 design guidelines have really given us some good guidance for this space. Um, it, it is going to remain an important space for continuing to host large scale events, but we can think about how we can elevate that. How can we add supporting infrastructure that really helps make it um, more feasible for those events? It's an important pedestrian corridor. Um, it's the cultural axis in the park. So how can we update the materials to make it um, last into the next 100 years? Uh, so rehabilitating it, but really thinking about the historic patterns that are on the ground. So our question for you for this space is um, similar to the last one. What would you like to experience along the central promenade? And you can select up to three here um, and also put things in chat. So temporary artful furnishings or planters. So this idea that they can move around. A seasonal shade canopy gets hot in Colorado. Um, community programs or events. So markets, cultural festivals, parades, a fashion show, fitness classes, seasonal events or a display lawn games like ping pong or shuffleboard or twister or chess, listening to music on an outdoor speaker system, working outside on your laptop with community Wi-Fi, a celebratory civic banner display that um, really could connect to the things that are going on in the city, and then we have the other that you can put additional ideas that you have, which we would love to hear in the chat. We're at about 70%, so I'll give it another moment. Okay, 
And it's slowed down a lot. So if you have your last vote, I'm about to hit end. All right. There we go. So the top answer here is community programs or events. So continuing really what it does today and how we think about that infrastructure is gonna be really important. Um, seasonal shade canopy was right up there too, which totally agree how we can, how we can make the space feel comfortable in the summertime. And then seasonal events and Wi-Fi. So great. Thanks, guys. Now we'll move on to the central gathering feature. So the bar is set really high for this. Um, the design guidelines and the master plan call for um, a three-dimensional design element in the center of the park. So really finishing this cultural axis through the park that's formed with the promenade and connecting those spaces. It's important that we um, keep the views to the between the state capitol and the city and county building using complementary materials that respect the historic character, um, integrating it with the promenade. And as we've talked about this as a team, Something that's really exciting to us is this idea that if you're if you're on your United or Southwest flight coming into Denver or visiting or you're leaving that you're reading about the top five things that you needed to do in Denver and this puts Civic Center on there that what whatever this is is something that really draws people and visitors and residents into the heart of the city. So. Um, as we think about that, it could be art, it could be water, it could be gardens, it could be a botanical display that's, um, that's interactive. So our question for you is really open-ended on this one. We're so early in the, in the design phase that we really do want to hear from you about what your ideas are for this space and thinking about um, things that that you've done in other cities or seen in other cities that might be a, might be something worth exploring or if you have a new idea of something that could happen in this um, part of the park. And so we'll give you a little bit to write in some chat answers and we'll read a couple of those. We're already getting some great ones. We've heard a carousel, we've heard a disco roller rink, an ice rink in the winter, a grand fountain, sculpture with gardens, kinetic sculpture, a temporary climate display, and more trees, more flowers, indigenous oriented gardens. Well, please, please keep these coming. I know we like they said we want to get to the Q and A at the end, but um, thank you all very much. This is awesome. It's an exciting space to think about what it can become. So keep your ideas coming. Um, we'd love to hear all of them. So the last space is the Greek theater and really making this a premier outdoor performance venue. It's, it's not just about rehabilitation and modifications, but how we can really um, elevate this space to have it as a, a pr premier event space in the heart of um, the city. So one, one precedent Im um, image that you see there that we've looked at is the historic Hearst Theater in Berkeley, California that has a Greek theater and they bring in a stage um, for three seasons out of the year at an overhead structure that helps with the technology to be able to host events there. So that might be something that um, we consider as we dive into how we can really respect the, his, the history of that structure, but um, make it really cool. How can, what can you experience there? And that gets to what our question is here. So what would you most like to experience in the Greek theater? And you can pick up to three on this answer, on this multiple choice question. And you can certainly, again, write things in chat if there's something that's not on this list. 
So local musical concerts and national touring performances, plays, theater, dance, or performances, so ballet, um, all kinds of things that could be in that category, organized group gatherings, community dances, lectures, speeches, and, or presentations, civic gatherings, a movie night, a live streaming of events. You could go there and watch, watch the Broncos or the Avalanche play, art installations, lunchtime under a shade structure. Is there something else there and it's not showing up on my screen? Yeah, we also have fitness classes as an option here as well. Thanks, Megan. I don't know why my screen, that one's cut off. So if that's a high vote, I'm not gonna be able to see that at all. <laughs> I don't think, I don't know what's happening there. Technology, the things that, uh, Okay, we're at 75%, a few more moments. Oh, I refreshed it and it came back. For all of you that were worried about me, I'm, I'm back, back on and able to see. <laughs> Okay, it's slowing down. So if you've got your vote to get in, do it now. Okay, we've got about 95 that have responded, so a little less. And don't worry, fitness is not at the top, so you wouldn't have missed it. They're still responding, to giving us great ideas on the central gathering feature. So plays, theater, dance, or other performances, great answer. Um, local music concerts coming in just a little bit lower than that one. And then I think our next one is the live streaming events. So, but we're pretty close there on a lot of those other responses, so. Thank you. And so now we've got another chat response about really, you know, what's missing? What types of activities and experiences are most important to bringing new energy to Civic Center when events are not happening? So um, I know I saw a, a chat comment about 18 hours a day activation. I think, you know, this park is big. There's, there's definitely spaces that can, can have that respite too when, when not large things are happening. So so what, what is it that can bring new energy? We're already getting some great ideas. We've heard permanent food and beverage. Uh, some Greek theater events include salsa under the stars and stand-up comedians, uh, science presentations. We've heard a children's playground. Another vote for salsa. <laughs> These are awesome. All right, I'll read a couple more. We've got art an artist's row, uh, speaker's corner. Uh, now they're going so quickly, I can't keep up. <laughs> Chess um, and an amateur's observatory. I'll, I'll, I'll please keep these coming. Thank you. Keep writing them in, and you can you can listen to me as I go on here. So. We're gonna talk about principle three now, which is really starting to get into more of the physical design. Cele celebrate the historic significance of the Civic Center landmark. So Civic Center is one of the, it's the only um, historic park in the city of Denver. So that's really um, something to, to celebrate and acknowledge and continue forward into the future. Um, we have a lot of design guidance to, to build our ideas around, um, going all the way back to the early 1900s with the Edward Bennett's plan that was focused in the City Beautiful movement to the most recent 2005, 2009, 2017 outdoor downtown plan that give guidance to how we can 
how we can form and revitalize these spaces in the park. So the park is really designed around these um, the, the cultural axis and the civic axis in the park. So that east-west connection between the state capitol and the city and county building and the north-south connection between the Voorhees Memorial and the Greek theater that ties into really this outstand, you know, to the Denver Out Art Museum, the library, all these civic connection, civic institutions that surround the park that really um, can, can draw into the space and these views that are created by that. There are also um, vertical changes that are historic in the park with the balustrade wall that um, forms in the center right around that central gathering feature. So the upper terrace is at the Broadway level and it steps down to the lower terrace, which is where Bannock Street sits. So we really need to think about accessibility as we think about these spaces, how we can move through them and link them and connect them to the park. Um, the four integrated spaces, again, that we're talking about, I, I think we've, we've highlighted those and you guys have given us some great feedback about them. I think how we think about the infrastructure for the park and, and, and elevate it into the next 100 years as we look at these spaces is really important. And history is not something that's just um, set in the buildings and sculpture. It can really be something that ties into new technology. So um, the, the, the light displays that happen at the civic buildings around Civic Center are so incredible. And how can we think about bringing some of that light into the park that they could be artful architectural lighting that starts to tell stories about the history of the space um, that can really be immersive, using reflective materials that can put um, designs on the ground plane that start to tell some of those stories of the history and the past. And it can also be something that's interactive um, as you're in the park, whether it's signage, it could be paving patterns on the ground, it could be, um, you know, this is a civic center is a place where a lot of school buses come here for for tours and how we can start to to um, get kids involved with the history that has happened in the park and the stories that it has to tell over the hundred years that it's been here and the people and the culture that is all so so rich in the park and so we've got a question for you again this one is a polling question so you get to pick your top two of how would you like to experience history within the park? Um, and I think you guys, you've got such great ideas. I'm guessing you're gonna have even more to put in the chat on this one as well. So the historic, or using projection and light to highlight historic elements, historic signage, self-guided tours with mobile applications, historic elements or text integrated with park elements, and is that other? Mine fell off again. I think that's the other in chat. All right, this one's moving a little slower. So I think I'll give it a few more moments. Get your votes in. Okay, so we've got a little over 80 votes. I'm gonna go ahead and hit end. It might be some write-ins that are coming. Yeah that I think if you close the poll, you can still write in chat. You won't be locked out of participating that way. So the number one answer at 65% was historic elements or text integrated with park elements. And I'd say all of these are pretty high. So using, using 
projection or light, it was at 52 and 41% are the self-guided tours with mobile applications. And if you've got ideas in the chat, keep them coming. Our fourth principle is thinking about the next 100 years and resiliency. So incorporate resilient design to ensure Civic Center is a model for successful urban ecology, sustainability, and long-term vitality for the next 100 years. Um, we know how important the urban tree canopy is to the city of Denver um, and how, how we, it's not just for, for shade, but also for soil health and habitat and improving that for the city. As we look at um, Civic Center, because we have this historic um, context that we have to work within, what you see here on the left the green and the yellow are the contributing vegetation patterns that were um, in the original design. And the central promenade really um, is, is open. It keeps those views between the Voorhees Memorial and the Greek theater and the, along the cultural axis. And the civic access is also really open. So you have those view corridor connections between the Capitol and the the city and county building. But as we look at Bannock Street, I think there are some opportunities there to um, improve the tree canopy on the north and south sides and how we can bring shade in through that way. So that's something that we want to explore through the design process. Urban ecology is really important. Um, cultivating biodiversity, how we think about regionally sensitive plant material that can bring color and all, all color and winter interest all year round. Um, we have the opportunity, we might not be able to do it with, with tree plantings, but gardens in the park are, are wonderful today. And I think they, sh they definitely need to be in the future. How can we think about temporary planting installations that, that might be movable planters along the promenade? Water is something that's very um, critical in, in Denver and how, how we look at low water perennial plantings that can bring that seasonal color and diversity to the spaces. Green infrastructure and renewable energy. So we wanna look at alternative energy sources. We know that there's a steam um, connection nearby. We wanna explore if that's something that's possible. There's solar and wind. Um, green infrastructure, the opportunity to integrate water quality plantings into the park in a way that, that meets that historic um, look. And permeable paving, I think that's something that we can explore as we look at the central promenade um, and redoing the paving. Is there a way that we can capture some of that rainwater and, and build um, the groundwater back up? So what resiliency strategies seem most important to Civic Center? And this is a multiple choice to pick your top two. Um, increasing shade, cultivate biodiversity, adaptable systems for future park needs. So that would be um, like a, a light pole that could also serve as a shade canopy. It has multiple uses, green infrastructure, renewable energy sources incorporate low water planting, designing for all ages, and always, always put things in chat too. Okay, we're about 70% voted. So a few more moments. Okay. 
Okay, I'm about to hit end. <laughs> All right, here we go. Thanks, Laura. Oh, increasing shade took the lead at the end. <laughs> I think so. It, it's a neck and neck tie with green infrastructure. Um, I was watching that one go back and forth. So those are great answers, incorporating low water planting. Um, thank you. I'm gonna pass it back to Meredith to it going to go through the last principle so we have one more principle one more question for you guys and then we are going to get to q a so um i think there's going to be some interest in this one just based on what i'm seeing in chat so this last principle is unify civic center by implementing citywide connectivity visions to link to surrounding cultural recreational and civic spaces and reinforcing physical and visual connections to the surrounding district so we have taken a look at kind of the broader connections and some of the mobility connections surrounding Civic Center. And while obviously none of them go through Civic Center, there, there are a number that go around. Um, Bannock Bikeway, as I mentioned before, um, will remain along Bannock and is again, a key critical kind of north-south uh, gateway um, for, for bikes. Um, we have the proposed Metro ride extension um, as well as a proposed uh, protected bike lane along Broadway. So while those, while those are not in place today, they are planned for the future. So we are definitely considering those as, through our design work. Um, and certainly the 5280 loop as well, um, that doesn't uh, touch Civic Center or go through it, but it's really nearby. And so thinking about how we start to capture um, some of those people moving nearby and around Civic Center and drawing them in. And we've looked at some the nearby cultural destinations and other land uses. Um, the, the blue buildings are the governmental buildings, so I think everyone knows that there, there's a lot of those surrounding the park. Um, but there's also the great cultural assets on the south side of the park. So presents a real great opportunity to draw some of that programming into the park or um, to draw those, uh, those visitors and those users of those spaces into the park. On the residential front, um, there's certainly not as many residential uses or buildings around the park. Um, there's one planned nearby um, and, and some others on the south side, but uh, that's really a key part of our consideration as we're thinking about how do we activate the park on a daily basis um, and also provide almost more neighborhood park kind of uses within Civic Center. So it's a real draw um, for the nearby residents. But part of that is getting people to the park. Um, and I know that we know that the roads around the park are, are a real barrier. Um, you know, Colfax is a barrier, Broadway is a barrier. Um, but you know, this, uh, this effort will kind of explore how we get people to the park. And so while the scope of this effort isn't specifically looking at the roadways, um, what we do want to understand from you all is what would make, make it a better experience to get to the park? Um, so the images on the right are just views from the top one is from the north side looking at the Voorhees Memorial. So kind of across uh, Colfax and um, where uh, 15th branch is off. And then on the south side, it's looking to the Greek theater from the museum. So you can see that there it is, it feels like these roadways are a big barrier um, to get into the park at, at, at times. But Cole, uh, uh, excuse me, Bannock really presents an opportunity for new gateways into the park. So looking at it from 14th and Colfax, um, these edges and these conditions um, provide a really great opportunity to rethink how we draw people into the park. So with that, we do have a question for you guys, and it's how can we reduce the perceived distance between the park and neighbor, neighbor, neighboring destinations and improve the experience when connecting to the park? So, as I said, we know the roadways are a barrier. Um, and while we're not specifically looking at the roads as part of this process, we definitely want to hear from you all about what would make it better. So um, there's definitely the other option here to put something in chat, but a few thoughts we have, and some of them are programmatic and some of them are more um, physically oriented. 
Um, what is the pull more cultural programming into the park, right? So if you have programming in there, it becomes a real draw for people to come into the park. Um, also linking Civic Center to the urban trails and bikeways in clearer and stronger ways, making pedestrian crossings more visible um, or creating pedestrian, stronger pedestrian gateways at some of those key entry points to the park. So again, this is our last polling question. After this, we're gonna to go to Q&A. So share your thoughts um, and then we'll get to some of your questions. Let's just give it another few seconds for and we can launch the results. Great. Yep, we're about 75% voted. We had a few moments. All right, get your last votes in. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and end. So the clear front runner here is really creating stronger pedestrian gateways. Um, linking to trails and making the pedestrian crossings more visible seem very important as well. A few things in, in chat I saw about the speeds of the cars and, and parking were other um, desires to make the, to kind of reduce this perceived barrier. So thank you all for that feedback. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Jenna, QA. Great, thanks so much, Meredith, and to the whole consultant team for a really amazing presentation. We really appreciate um, all the thoughts and feedback that we've gotten from the community. We've, we've asked you a lot of questions tonight, but this part of the presentation is the part that I'm most excited about because we get a chance to hear from you all, the questions that you have for us about the project, about Civic Center, and about um, Civic Center Next 100. So I have a bunch of questions. Um, it looks like we have almost 37 questions in the Q&A. We won't have time to get to all of those tonight, but we absolutely are noting them and we will be getting back to you all with um, a written document following this evening. But in the meantime, I'm going to direct a couple of questions to our panelists. Um, we can go ahead and change the screen view. Great, thanks, Meredith. Um, the first question is from Keith, and I'm gonna direct this question to Nicole. Um, Keith asks, the area that you are proposing for a central gathering space is currently the most beautiful public gardens in the city. How will you ensure that the gardens are not destroyed in this process? We don't need more pavement in the park. Thanks, Keith. I think uh, we're open right now to that, to those ideas. And I think, as you saw through the presentation, we talked a lot about um, gardens and green space that's so important and loved in this in the park. So, I I wouldn't think I don't I don't know if I'd rule out that it's all going to be paved. I think there's definitely some options that we can look at that um, balance balance that. Great, thanks, Nicole. The next question is gonna go to Gordon. Gordon, this question is from Terry. Um, we've had a lot of questions about safety and security in the park. And the question is, what can be done to remove people in the park who engage in open illegal drug use? I don't feel safe even walking in the park anymore and I live four blocks. I've lived four blocks from the park for over 25 years. Hi, Terry. Thanks for the question. It's an ongoing issue with us. Um, it's always been something we've strived to improve. We've improved our, our ranger program. It's, it's now one of the biggest in the country. We have a great relationship with the police department. Uh, illegal use in the park is illegal use. And so we are working hard um, to, to uh, improve that situation, but it will never be perfect. Um, but we will continue to work on it and we will continue to think about that as part of our design process in this project as well. Great, thank you, Gordon. The next question is gonna to go to Mark Bernstein. This question is from Bradley and Bradley says that they used to go down to the park during the holiday season to view the lights at the city and county building. But the closure of Bannock has made that very difficult. Is it possible to reopen Bannock during the holiday season so people can drive by, park, get out and look at the holiday lights? That's a great question, Bradley. Thank you so much for uh, posing that. There's a lot of history to 
this idea of closing Bannock to vehicles and in turn creating a grand civic space. There's been a lot of good planning that's been done with our partners and the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure as well as Parks and Recreation looking at our parks and public spaces downtown, and particularly Civic Center. And with some of the last slides that Meredith shared with us and even the polling, we understand that the streets surrounding Civic Center are really one of the greatest challenges in, in us you know, making Civic Center what we all dream for it to be. And it's because they, they really are barriers and, and providing those kind of connections and links are really important. And, and even as the folks responded tonight, uh, looking at Bannock as a gateway uh, into the park I think is a tremendous opportunity. We're really excited about how Bannock can become some type of grand civic space to continue to support all the events and activities that we enjoy. But the, the reality is, is that a couple of summers ago, uh, the Public Works Department at that time, it's now Dotty, uh, closed Bannock. There was a, a test done during that summer where we uh, looked at any impacts um, in taking Bannock off of the downtown street grid and we were actually really um, pleasantly surprised that it did not have any adverse effects um, to traffic whatsoever. And so, you know, that idea really became um, the basis in which we then implemented the first phase of the Bannock Street closure this past summer. And that was the first step uh, as we are now looking at the permanent transformation into, again, uh, transforming Bannock into this public space. We recognize that the city and county building during the winter time uh, you know, the way it's adorned with lights, it, it has been a tradition for so many. And we were really excited about the opportunities to continue to grow in that tradition. And, uh, and we saw that this past winter when um, there was the, uh, the festival in the middle of the park. And, you know, that's just the beginning. We'll continue to build on that and uh, really excited to create new opportunities and create new traditions. Great. Thanks for that, Mark. The next question is going to Happy. And this question is from Paz. Um, the question is, in an effort to further honor indigenous territory, the removal of racist statues was key for some activists for understandable reasons. Is there a reason or is there a way to commission an indigenous garden with flora, food, indigenous to this territory and a statue or art installment, installment that honors the territory with actual tribal input commissions potentially by tribal peoples. Uh, Paz, uh, thank you for that. And, and thank you for the several ideas that I've, I've uh, seen that you entered into uh, the chat and for uh, elevating and, and keeping um, that uh, the, uh, our uh, purpose in recognizing our indigenous peoples uh, uh, at the forefront of this conversation. Um, the, the short answer is yes, uh, all, uh, all of these ideas are important, and uh, I, I, I think it would be a, a very important principle to ensure that in some manner, whether it's through plantings or art, uh, including some of our activities, activation of the space, that we are continuing to find ways to, uh, to elevate and engage and include uh, it, uh, the um, importance of our indigenous community. So uh, keep the ideas coming. Um, and, uh, I, uh, and, and Civic Center Space won't be the only place, by the way. It, it, it certainly offers some opportunities in, in many other uh, public spaces around our city to think about these creative ways to uh, pay homage uh, to um, our city's uh, uh, first, first residents. So thank you. Thank you, Happy. The next question is gonna to go to Meredith. Um, this is from Patty. Can someone adjust the stoplight on 14th to reflect the fact that there are no longer cars coming south on Bannock, please? Maybe pedestrian triggered buttons and bicycle triggered sensors? Yeah, Patty, great question. I think that um, that uh, will definitely need to be um, changed as part of the permanent improvements. Um, I think that, you know, knowing that, that there were phased improvements going in and the phase one improvements that Mark alluded to in phase two, we will have to get the bike, you know, the, the signalization with the, the bike and, you know, the vehicular movements all at the intersection resolved through this. So um, it's definitely something that we can, uh, we'll look at as we get all kind of that final design um, uh, figured out through the process. Thank you, Meredith. The next question is for Eric. 
Um, Eric, this question is from William. William says, along the lines of incorporating sustainability into the design and supporting year-round community engagement, has thought been given to an urban agriculture component? Um, no, th William, thank you for that question. And um, you know, one of the little known treasures actually in Civic Center right now is um, the, the organization Grow Local uh, maintains um, some gardens um, in Civic Center during the growing season. And um, actually this past year, um, Parks and Rec actually turned over a few more of the planting beds over to them. And, um, you know, it, it increasingly gets popular with, with, with urban ag becoming more of a thing. Um, I know we continue to have conversations with both Grow, Grow Local, Endeavor Urban Gardens and things like that. And so uh, like a few other people have said, there, there's a lot of ideas um, on the table and we're not ruling anything out right now, but, um, you know, certainly it, it's a great way to um, an alternative to um, some of the colorful plantings in horticulture that we do. Great, thank you, Eric. And Eric, I'm actually gonna direct this next question back at you. Um, this question is from Tony and Tony's thinking about clear, clean restroom options for events. His uh, four-year-old really needed to go to the restroom while enjoying the holiday lights and they were scrambling to find a restroom. Yes, um, we, 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 I, I saw restrooms come up uh, countless times, um, you know, throughout the chat and um, also in this, um, in the, in the Q&A. And, um, you know, the, the event permit requirements um, for events when they're in the park um, absolutely require a certain number of restrooms and things like that. Um, there are certainly some challenges this year um, with uh, Chris Kindle in particular, be, because of COVID regulations, the restrooms had to be inside the, um, inside the fence line. And so people visiting a holiday lights didn't have that, but um, we hear loud and clear. Um, and I know our friends at the city do as well about the need for more accessible public restrooms and things like that. And I, I think that's, 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 that's heard and uh, we'll continue to pursue that. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, the next question, uh, let's see here. My question and answer is jumping all around since we've getting so many great questions. Let's see, this question is gonna go to Mark Bernstein. Mark, this is from Tommy. Uh, should Bannock remain open to traffic to keep the park stitched into Denver's street grid? Thanks for that question, Tommy. Um, as I was mentioning in responding to the other question, there's been a lot of studies that have been done uh, through the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure where they're looking at um, traffic studies and understanding the, the role of Bannock within the, the downtown street grid. And through that street closure that occurred a few summers ago where the, where the street was closed for a couple of blocks, the, uh, the, the traffic patterns were studied very closely. And in turn, uh, what was realized is that it did not have a major adverse impact. Um, instead, Dottie has identified that Bannock really is a key connection, a key corridor uh, by corridor, I should say, into downtown. And so as we are looking at the phase two permanent transformation of Bannock into a, a pedestrian way, a bike way, as well as a, a grand civic space, uh, we are gonna be looking at those kind of mobility facilities as an integral part of the design. Great, thank you, Mark. The next question is gonna go to Gordon, and this is from Ozzy. Um, Ozzy says the Denver Public Library is in the middle of a major renovation that includes an event space facing the park and an outdoor play space for kids. Are there any master plan ideas to tie into what they've got underway? That's a great question, Ozzy. Absolutely. We are working very closely with the Denver Public Library on their plans, including the outdoor space that will be fronting on 14th and looking at the backside of the Greek theater. Uh, we're excited to help them realize that. And, and your question is exactly right. How do we integrate that wonderful new amenity uh, and, and the, all the renovations taking place across the street? So I think it begs the question of what 14th wants to be. It's, it's a very um, high speed uh, street right now. And I think our goal would be to see how we can reduce and remove cars uh, uh, between those two spaces so that it better works with the new Civic Center Greek Theater and all the other amenities in the park. So that's something we're gonna be looking at. It's not part of our project per se, but it's something that we wanna ensure that it has uh, uh, further consideration. Uh, those are
Oh, did we lose Gordon? I thought I got left for a no. second. Okay. All right. Well, while we're waiting for Gordon to come back, I have a question for Megan. Megan, this question's from Lynn, and Lynn's asking about sculpture in the park that people can interact with, maybe including water with gardens, like some of the plazas that you see in Rome. Um, what are the opportunities to create uh, places where we can feature sculpture, water, and for places, places for people to sit? That's a great question. I appreciate it. Um, we've got some great guidance from the 2009 design guidelines and the 2005 master plan to help inform what's going to happen, especially within that central gathering feature, um, that being some sort of potentially permanent um, addition to the park. Um, gardens are specifically noted as an important um, component to the future for that space, as well as water in some shape or another. Um, and, and places to sit and rest and, and feel comfortable. So um, the form that that might take um, can go any number of ways. And that's really why we're going through this process to, to understand what would best serve the space. Um, but we're also looking at opportunities for temporary sculpture and, and temporary art elements, especially those that can be interactive and constantly changing, ensuring that you've got a different experience within Civic Center from one visit to the next. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. And I think with that, we are out of time in terms of answering questions, but please keep them coming for the, the next few minutes. Um, we will be sure to answer as many as we can following the workshop. And I think Kelly will now walk us through our next steps. Yes, thank you, Jenna. Um, and thank you all again for all of your questions and interaction throughout the webinar. This concept design effort is allowing us to generate and brainstorm ideas for design intent. So far, we have gone through fact finding, discovery, and analysis. And this is the first public workshop where we are presenting some of these concepts and options that we have come up with thus far. We will take your input and we'll narrow down some of the workable options at each project location. As you can see here, we will then present these at the next public outreach event, which will occur in about two months or in early April. From this information and thoughts that we receive back from you, we will then narrow down the ideas to one or two for each location, which we will then present to you for a third time, um, which will also be the final time for this phase um, at the beginning of the summer, which will be in about um, end of May, early June. And these concept level designs will then be finalized and used for design procurement, which will consist of formal design for construction documents. So um, to the right of the screen, as you can, as has been mentioned, the Greek theater um, has $4 million for it, which was funded by the Elevate Denver Bond. This will be for both design and construction. We are still currently gathering funding for the remaining three projects, the Central Promenade, the Central Gathering Feature, and for Bannock Street Plaza. We anticipate that this funding will consist of a combination of both public and private funding. So again, um, just please continue to watch for the invites for the remaining two public meetings throughout this conceptual design process. And I'll turn it back to Jenna for the final slide. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Please stay in touch with us. We wanna hear from, from all of you. If you have additional questions, comments, you can email me directly about the Civic Center Next 100 project at jenna.harris at denvergov.org. If you have additional thoughts or know of others who would like to give us their feedback who were not able to attend this evening, you can provide comments on the Civic Center Next 100 project via our online survey, which will be live until March 5th. Stay connected to project updates by visiting our website, denvergov.org slash the outdoor downtown. And finally, we hope you, hope you can join us for a second public workshop this spring. So thank you so much for your time and input this evening on this amazing project. Thank you all for joining. Thanks everyone. Thank you, I'm gonna go ahead and end the presentation. Great job everybody. Sorry I got yeah. dropped off. Thanks everyone, thanks Laura.